refugee crisis, nuclear nations, a rising deficit, and a very chaotic presidential election. We all have issues that are looming above us, too big for each one person to take care of. Oftentimes, we hear nothing but negativity on the news, on social media, reminding us that we are powerless, that there are these issues too big for us to control. And the truth is, that's kind of true. There's a lot of things beyond our control. But I'm here today to tell you about something that is in your control. No matter who you are, no matter where you are, there's one thing you can control at all times, and it's how you treat others. Respect. I argue that this is one of the most important things about you, because the way you treat others defines you more than anything else. In covering this topic, I'll have four main points. The first, we'll define what respect is. The second, we'll look at two examples of respect, one positive, one negative. The third will be practical ways to improve respect in daily life. And the fourth will be an imagination. What would it be like really for you, personally, if respect is at the forefront of your concern? Now, we all know the statistic. There are seven billion people on the planet. That's a lot of people. It's a lot of individuals. As we all know from personal experience, it can be easy to take the things you have the most of for granted. And something we don't think about is how we have so many people around us. Just in this room, there's an estimated 1,500 people, 1,500 lives, 1,500 stories, 1,500 souls and personalities. Each one is special, each one's important. As Dr. Seuss says, and though it's cliche, a person's a person, no matter how small. And it's true. In a 2016 interview with David Mercer, I asked him what he views as respect, what he defines respect as. David Mercer is the first assistant federal public defender for the Western District of Missouri, and also a legal chairperson for Drury University. And he defined respect simply. He said, it's being valued. In his line of work, Mr. Mercer deals with a series of people, criminals, those we might view as the worst in our society, and judges and lawyers, and the judicial system, which is based on a huge fundamental understanding of respect and value. I asked him, how do you maintain a level of respect for all people at all times, and though he's not perfect, he said this, though it might sound like I'm running for Pope, the whole purpose of life is to serve something greater than yourself. That's his underlying value. We don't live just for ourselves, and respect cannot be lived if you try to live only for yourself. Respect is realizing that the people around you have value, inherent and in of themselves. That our common humanity is all we need to understand the value of someone else, regardless of how much we like them, how much we agree with them, or how much they are in line with our views. Now that we've established what respect is, we can take a look at an example. And the information from the story I'm about to share comes from a Radio Lab production directed by Karen Duff in 2015. I'll take you back in time to June 2nd in 1943 to the small town of Aliceville, Alabama. And on that day, on this morning, 1,000 German prisoners, prisoners of war, were being delivered to this town, which was also very small. Now the townspeople found themselves in a predicament. They were about to have arriving in their little town 1,000 people who were a part of Rommel's North African division for the Nazi party, one of Hitler's most feared and cruel groups of people. And they had to decide, these, these evil people, because they did horrible things, were they going to be treated well? How are you going to treat them? And over the next following weeks and months, they, the townspeople of Aliceville treated these prisoners with the utmost respect. Many prisoners of war were noted for saying how much they loved peanut butter after arriving in this, this town because it was the first thing they ate when they got off the train. Before those doors opened, they were afraid of what would be there. They knew how they treated their prisoners. They were expecting the same treatment. But in reverse, they were given clean towels, clean beds, good food. A negative example that I'm about to share with you comes from a 2009 documentary from National Geographic titled Inside North Korea. And in this documentary, there's a story brought to us from a ex-prison guard for camp number 22. Camp number 22 is a family camp, if there is such a thing for them, uh, that comes and is used for only family members of traitors to the state. 
This family camp carries in it also children and a variety of people of all ages. And this prisoner guard said that before he went to this camp to guard these people, he was educated. And the forefront of the education was the idea that they tried to embed into him, which was, do not act like these people you're guarding are human beings. He went and directly said, if you thought you were a human being when you entered camp number 22, you could not survive. He tells a story about two young boys who were so hungry they fought for a corn kernel found in some dump. They washed it in a muddy puddle and consumed it like it was good for them. Now both these examples are extreme. I doubt that any of us will really deal with Nazi prisoners of war or find ourselves guarding people in a prison camp anytime soon. But there's a lot of life lived in between these two extremes and how we act and respond and think now, this very second in all of our seats, will define how we act in those situations if they ever come. And if they don't, that's fine. But we're still left with the decision of respecting those around us every day. I would like to quote Nelson Mandela when he says, a nation is not judged by how, it's treat how it treats its highest citizens, but its lowest ones. How true are these words? And I want each of you to think right now how you walk about in the, the day and what you think of those around you the student in class that annoys you, the homeless person on the side of the street, the aunt that just seems to get your goat, or someone that disagrees with you politically or religiously. How do you treat those people? And though your differences and thoughts uh, may have importance, the way you treat them is the utmost example of who you are and what you think. Now, I would like to deal uh, with some practical ways for us to engage better with each other on daily life, I guess you could say. Uh, one example I'd like to bring to you comes from a 2015 interview from Katie Martin, a US diplomat's widow. Hallbrook, the diplomat that passed away, was one of our best US diplomats in past history. Uh, he was respected in Washington, D.C. for the way he filled up those around him and for the way he treated people. And when asked what made her husband such a good diplomat, she responded that he realized lots of situations simply could not be muscled through, but that you had to understand and respect the opinions and the culture from those you dealt with. And a similar thought, I'll quote Dale Carnegie from his book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, dated in 1986 from the edition I used. And he quoted Henry Ford when he said that anyone's secret of success is simple. It lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from that person's angle as well as from your own. And what a different world it would be if we could actually have a conversation where we respectfully can disagree but see things from another person's angle. And even if we don't agree on those angles or where we come from, we can at least treat that other person simply as a person. The third point I would like to bring to you comes from Jim McCormick in a book he wrote in 2012 titled The First Time Manager. In this book, he discusses what it means to have class, and he defines class as the training people with the ability and the dignity and the humanity that their person deserves. Treating them not as objects of production and not as a means of, to an end. If we maybe took a step back from society, all the issues we have, and looked at each other not as enemies or evil people or good people, but simply started with the fact that each of us is a person, inherently valuable, we could maybe have better discussions. You can get into a sticky mess when you start thinking of yourself more than others, and a life lived like that produces no good. I would like to encourage each of you to step forward thinking of what life would be like if we respected each other more. Needless to say, our leaders tend to have an issue with this, as our presidential election definitely shows. They treat each other like second and third graders, blaming each other for things that don't really matter sometimes. And as he pointed out, if we actually looked at them for what they did and who they were, as opposed to how well they can speak and offend each other, maybe we would be on the right track. But it starts with you, and you, and you, as an individual, respecting everyone around you for who they are, just because they are a person. And if you start there, you only have better places to go.